Hello, I'm Javad Hashmi. I'll be presenting uh, on the topic of Hadith. The topic of my, uh, the name of, the title of my presentation is The Muslim Mishnah. By God, I will never clothe God's book with anything, in this case, the Hadith. A little bit about myself. I'm a PhD candidate in the study of religion at Harvard University. Uh, I can be followed on Twitter. That's where I'm most active. Uh, I had to differentiate myself from another Javad Hashmi who's apparently a famous politician. Um, so it's Dr. Javad T. Hashmi. And I'm also, um, I do have a small YouTube channel that you can follow as well. So why did I choose this title for my presentation? Well, these are words that are attributed to the second Caliph of Islam, uh, Caliph uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, one of the rightly guided Caliphs. Um, so he is reportedly have, to have said, do you really want a Mishnah like the Mishnah of the people of the book? And by God, I will never clothe God's book with anything. Now, with these sorts of uh, quotations, we of course have to uh, approach them with a sense of caution. Whether or not he actually said these words verbatim, uh, that's up for debate. And obviously this is a uh, you know, uh, presentation on hadith, uh, you know, and I take a skeptical view towards hadith, so it would be a little hypocritical of me to take this uncritically, which I am not doing. Um, but what we, what we can say is that many such uh, quotations are attributed to Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, to such an extent that I think we can say that he probably had a negative view towards um, anything that could rival the Quran. And his fear was that uh, the early Muslims would take something uh, in addition to the Quran. Um, and so this is what we're going to discuss in this presentation. So what we see is that in early Islam, there was this kind of battle between what you can call scripturalism and oral law between the Quran on the one side and Hadith on the other. The Quran itself seems to weigh in on this debate uh, because the Quran takes a negative view of, you know, it seems like it's taking a negative view of oral law. So in 931, the Quran says, they have taken their rabbis and their priests as lords besides God. Um, and there are other verses in which it seems to say that they take them as lords besides God because they allow them to dictate what's halal and what's haram. And we can contrast that view, that scripturalist view in the Quran with what we see in the hadith in which there is this validation of what can be called oral law. So this is a hadith attributed to um, the prophets. Inni utitu al-kitaba wa mithlahu ma'ahu yet known that I have been given the Quran and something like it. So you see that word mithla can also even mean an equivalent to it. And this is the view that will be taken by the later tradition that we are going to be critical of. So we see that early on there was this fear that uh, there would be something attributed uh, to the prophet that would then rival the Quran. Again, let's go back. We can see the quote, do you really want a Mishnah like the Mishnah of the people of the book? And it's talking about rabbinical Judaism. And I realize this can come across a little bit if you uh, analyze it you know, in a decontextualized manner, it could come across as a little anti-Semitic. But uh, really the Quran is uh, critical of Jews and Christians and even believers in some uh, circumstances. Uh, but where it's critical of the Jews is just rabbinical Judaism. Uh, it takes up some of the uh, discourse uh, in Christian literature, uh, which is kind of against the Pharisees and the Quran is kind of taking up this polemic. Um, so it's not against Juda all of Judaism, but rather against this kind of rabbinical form of Judaism in which the scribes or the rabbis become very powerful. So we can contrast this to the work of Jonathan Brown, who is a Muslim academic at Georgetown University, a great scholar. Um, but, and he is one of the, you know, I think the best defenders of Hadith um, in the West. And uh, he wrote this book called Hadith, Muhammad's Legacy in the Medieval and Modern World. And he has a second book called Misquoting Muhammad. Um, in fact, I almost took that as the title of this presentation um, because I don't think uh, Dr. Brown's book does that title justice since he takes a more, uh, one could say maybe charitable view towards the Hadith, whereas I take a more skeptical view as you will see. But what we see from Dr. Brown's work, so he's the best defender of it in the academy, a Muslim academic, um, is that even he inadvertently made the admission perhaps that uh, 
the Hadith is equivalent to the Mishnah or the Oral Torah. So this is a quote from his book. And he notes that this process is common to Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. So in all of these traditions, apparently there is a written thing and then there's an oral thing. So the written Torah and an oral Torah. Eventually in the early third century, the oral Torah was set down in written form in the Mishnah. This is where it all comes full circle. The fear that is attributed to the second Caliph, Umar, I think it has been fulfilled. How do we know that? Well, Dr. Brown himself says, when someone asks you a question, what does Islam say about some issue? They usually want to know what the Quran says. But then he says, quote, yet the Quran is not the source to which a curious reader should refer in order to answer the question, what does Islam say about a particular issue? In Islamic civilization, the Sunnah has ruled over the Quran, shaping, specifying, and adding to the revealed book. The unit through which the Sunnah was preserved, transmitted, and understood, of course, has been the Hadith, because the Hadith is the carrier of the Sunnah for all practical purposes. So what you see here is an admission of the fact that uh, the Muslims created the equivalent of an oral Torah, the Mish like the Mishnah, uh, the Talmud, which is the Gemara and the Mishnah, and, uh, they, and that rules over the Quran. At, or to use the words of uh, the second caliph, it covers up or clothes the Quran. Uh, and I think that's a very accurate description because I agree with Dr. Brown. If you want to know if something is uh, a legal ruling in Islam, it's not the Quran that you usually turn to, but it's the Hadith. If you go to the legal books, the jurisprudential books, they're full of Hadiths that are very specific for each topic. And that's what takes the day, not the Quran, which is often just kind of window dressing on top. And we'll talk about this in more detail.